Good morning. My name is Pierre. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and it's my privilege to deliver God's word for you today. How many of you watched the news this week by a raise of hands? Was it as challenging for you to watch as it was for me? My goodness, what a challenging week. And as I think about the state of our nation and where we are today and the things that we need, I believe that we're in a time where we're in desperate need for wisdom. Would you agree? Our political leaders, they need wisdom. The next president of the United States, he or she, is going to need a boatload of wisdom. Our police officers, they need wisdom. Our business leaders and executives, even around the world, need wisdom. Entertainment, media, social media, even as individuals, we need wisdom to know how to manage that. Our families are in need of wisdom because our families aren't really getting stronger as we look at the statistics. How about the church? In a day and age that we're living in, do you think the church needs a little bit of wisdom? Gosh, we really need wisdom. And I think as you look at relationships, we could all use more wisdom. I personally need wisdom. I think of my role as a husband and how I need to be a better husband. And I think, God, I need wisdom for that. I think of my role as a father to kids who are going to go out into a world that is as scary as it is and probably going to get a little bit worse and more as time goes on. And I think, gosh, I need wisdom to know how to raise my kids in this generation. I need wisdom to handle my finances. I need wisdom to handle my matters here at church. I am in need of wisdom. And today I want to talk to you about God's wisdom, heavenly wisdom. But before I go into my message, I want to let you know that I'm probably the guy who's most disqualified to talk about wisdom. And here's why. You see, when I grew up and hung around the guys that I hung around, I was known for doing a lot of foolish things. I would do things just to gain people's attention or get a rise out of people or just to show that I really didn't care what other people thought. And so I earned, and I want to emphasize the word earned. I earned the name the fool. <laughs> now, mind you, I was not called a fool as in one of many. I was called the fool as in the premier, the ultimate. That was my nickname. But God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And when I became a Christian, there was a prayer that rose up in my heart that I believe was God, not me, because I wasn't wise enough to think of a prayer like this. And the prayer was simply this, Lord, give me wisdom beyond my years. You see, I don't want wisdom that's only at the level of my own age. I don't want wisdom that's only at the level of my own experience, meaning I don't want to learn just from my mistakes. I would much rather learn from your mistakes. Sorry. <laughs> I would much rather learn from mistakes of people who've gone before me. And fortunately, we hold the Bible full of mistakes. No, wait. I don't mean it has mistakes in what it says. I mean it has mistake after mistake in how people live their lives. And the Bible is just plain and simple telling you how people lived. Not only does the Bible give us examples of people's lives, it encourages us to seek wisdom. Look at this proverb. Proverb chapter 4, verse 7. It says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom... In all thy getting, get understanding. Now, I like the New Living Translation. It says, getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. Now, that's just a pithy statement there. So today, I want to talk to you about God's wisdom, and I'm going to give you eight characteristics of God's wisdom and questions you can ask yourself as you look at your own situation and try to make godly choices. Would you pray with me? Father God, we welcome your Holy Spirit right now as a church body in unity in faith, in the hope that today, God, you are going to impart your wisdom to your people, Lord, that your word will go forth in power. It will not return back to you void. 
So Lord, we declare that you will be glorified in this place, that we will leave here different people, and we ask, God, that you would empower me, open ears to hear, open my mouth to speak, and let your word go forth, Lord. We pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you this day. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. Amen. We're going to look at the book of James today. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 is where we'll start. James writes to the early church in Jerusalem and Jewish Christians, and he says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now please note, he said that our trials come in different size packages. There's all different types of trials. You have relationship trials, financial trials, you have cultural trials, you have a lot of different types of trials. But he says, consider it joy. Now when was the last time you considered a trial as joy? Probably not very frequently. Now he doesn't say it is joy. He says consider it joy. In other words, have the mindset that this is joyful. Why? He goes on to explain. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, perseverance is a word that means you push through the hard times. Back in May, I ran a race with my brother around Memorial Day weekend down at the shore. I despise running. I am a terrible, terrible runner. I did it just for the camaraderie of my brother, but I really, I don't like running. I'm not good at it. In fact, if you said, would you rather sleep on a bed of nails or run? I don't know. But I persevered, and I just kept running. And every time there was a water break, I took it. And I finished, and my time was lousy. But I got through. And at the end, they were gracious enough to give everybody a medallion. And the Bible says that if we persevere, there's a crown of life that God gives us. You see, I go to the gym and I work out, and I found that if you don't push weight that is a, a little bit of a test for you, if you don't push something that strain your muscles, your muscles don't grow. We don't usually grow on vacation. We grow when we have to push against hard times. That's how your faith grows. And that's why James says, consider it joy. Because in those hard times, you're getting stronger. In those hard times, you're learning how to lean on God more. You're learning that there's a God who is faithful, a God who is always present. He says, consider it joy. He said, let perseverance finish its work. Finish the race. Keep going. So that you may be what? Mature and complete, not lacking anything. And that's God's goal for your life. He wants to mature you. He wants to make you complete. And what does that look like? It looks like Jesus. God's goal is to make you more like Jesus. And let me tell you, Jesus didn't have a cakewalk. He lived in a life with trials and we can't become like Jesus without trials. And for this reason, James says, consider it joy because your trials are actually making you more like Jesus. They're giving you opportunity to be like God. When you're in a trial, let me ask you, what are the things you cry out to God for the most? Let me hear it. Comfort, help, peace, guidance, deliverance. Amen wisdom, strength, right? We often call out to God for these, these things. God, please give me comfort. God, oh, give me strength. God, give me through this. But James says in the following verse, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, he's saying wisdom is the thing you need when you're going through a hard time. And why is that? Because when you're going through a hard time, if you make unwise choices, it makes the hard time worse. Wisdom helps you navigate to get through the hard time quicker. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all. Now, whenever you read the Bible, you should ask yourself a few questions. What does this tell me about God? What does this tell me about myself? What does this tell me about how I should live? So back to this verse. If you ask God who gives generously to all, this is a way God's word is describing who God is. God is a God who gives generously to all. Amen? 
which I believe is a universal promise that means that no matter who you are, whether you know God or not, if you call out to God for wisdom, he's so generous that he will give wisdom because he wants the world to operate in his wisdom. And even if you're an unbeliever, God would give you wisdom because his wisdom will never go against his message of salvation. His wisdom will guide you in how to live. If you were a person who were ahead of a country and you called out for wisdom, God would grant it because God generously gives to all, just like he gives the sun and just like he gives the rain to all. We have a God who gives generously. And James says, when you're in those hard times, call out for wisdom because God is the one who gives generously without finding fault and it will be given to you. So how do we get this wisdom? There's three primary sources. The first source is God's word. How many have received God's wisdom through his word? Amen. Amen. The Bible says that his word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It shows us the way to go. Next, God's people. When you get around wise people, you become wiser. When you get, get around foolish people, In God's spirit, it's the prompting that happens within. It's the nudge that he gives you. It's the whisper. These are the ways primarily that God gives us wisdom in our lives. But what happens sometimes is that we look at our situations and we see things black and white. And the first counsel that I give you is this. No matter what hard time you're in, be sure to consider all your options. Consider all your options. I like how the New Living Translation reads in Proverbs 18, 15. It says, intelligent people are always open to new ideas. In fact, they look for them. There's a term. It's called false dilemmas. It's this idea that things are black and white. It's either black or white. And at times, especially as people of God, we think God's will, it's either this or that. It might not be black or white. It might be gray. It might be blue, could be orange. And my challenge to you is this, have you considered all your options? Ask yourself that question, do I know all my options? Last week, I got an email from a guy who I befriended through one of our outreaches. And we try to help one another out. And one of our congregation members was willing to help this guy out in a need that he had. And afterwards, he emailed me and he said, hey, Pierre, He said, would you like to come on a radio station with me in Lambertville next week, being this week? I said, that sounds like a fun thing. So it's email correspondence. I said, well, what will we talk about? And he shoots back an email with three questions. And when I read these questions, guys, I was like, oh my gosh. He wanted me to touch on some touchy topics. And I'm like, whoa, what do I do with this? I mean, this might not land well. So what did I do? I started seeking wisdom. I started asking people. I'm going to tell you what happened later. (laughs) Are you considering all your options? Now, when you have multiple options, here comes another problem that we have. How do I know which option is best? Maybe there's a couple. Maybe God's saying you could do this or that. But how do I eliminate some? Or how do I know some that are godly? James says, I'm not going to leave you hanging. He gives us this next verse. He says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. And it's full of two things. It's full of mercy and good fruits. And it's empty of two things. It's without partiality and it's without hypocrisy. These are the eight characteristics of wisdom. And today I'm going to give you these eight characteristics, what they mean. And I'm going to give you a question that you can ask yourself as you're reviewing wisdom. The first one, he says, is that God's wisdom is pure. And that word means chaste, holy, clean. God never leads you to do things that are contrary to his nature. God never leads you to do things that are against his word and against his law. He's not going to lead you to lie, cheat, or steal. A few weeks back, I went into Planet Fitness. I only had about 15 minutes to get a quick workout in. And then I was going to take a shower and I was going to get to work. It was one of those rush days. And I go in there. And as I go in, there's a guy coming out of the shower who I've met before. And this guy knows I work as a pastor. So every time he sees me, he calls me Rev. <laughs> Rev. Now, it's just, it's just the grace of God that you get called the fool. <laughs> and now you get called Rev. I mean, that's just God's humor, isn't it? 
Hey, Rev, how you doing, Rev? I said, I'm good, how you doing? And for some reason, he felt it was his day to make the locker room a confessional. <laughs> and he started to share with me some decisions that he was contemplating that would not be pure and that would affect his marriage severely. No more details needed. And so I tried my best in that 15-minute workout to step him back from the edge. I didn't tell him what to do because I find that people really don't want to hear it. I just tried to ask him about the consequences. What would happen five years from now if you made that decision? How would this affect this person and that person? God doesn't give us wisdom that's impure. God's wisdom is pure. Now, I don't judge that guy because I have things that tempt me too. Anyone else have some temptations? I was riding this week back from the pool that my family goes to. It was just my daughter, Olivia, and I. And I got an eight-year-old who dropped a word of wisdom on me that was incredible. My daughter, Olivia, and I are sitting in the car, and I'm just telling her how much I love her. And she says, I love you back. You know, I love you. I love you. And it's going back and forth. And then she says, she kind of trumps me. She says, Dad, you're the best. And I thought, oh boy. I thought, thank God she's still eight, you know? <laughs> I thought, I'm going I'm to short circuit this though because I know where this is going later on in life. So I just said, I just thought I'd bring it out, right? I said, Daddy has a lot of weaknesses, dear. And she said this. This is wisdom from the mouth of a child. Ready? She said to me this. Dad, you see, everyone has a weakness, but some people don't admit that they have a weakness, and that's their weakness. Amen. Close the book, set it down, sermon's over. <laughs> Done. I said, Olivia, would you please take my phone and write that down for me? That's good. We all have weaknesses, and when we're in trying times, we're more vulnerable. And we're vulnerable to three things. We're vulnerable to toxic habits. We're vulnerable to toxic thinking. And we're vulnerable to toxic people. And so let me ask you, what are the toxic habits that you run to when times are hard or are tempted to run to? What are the toxic ways of thinking, fear, manipulation, running, whatever? Who are the toxic people you run to? God's wisdom is pure. And I'm just going to say, when you're in a tempting time, the, the temptation is hotter to go towards those toxic things. Run. So here's the question you need to ask yourself as you're looking at your options. Can I do this with a clean conscience? Can I do what I'm about to do with a clean conscience? God's wisdom is also peaceable. That means peace-loving. It means living in peace with others and promoting peace. So I told you earlier, I had this opportunity to be on this radio station. And as I talked to different people, I was getting different advice. Some were saying, I don't know, it sounds like a trap. I don't think there's any way to win in this conversation. And other people were saying, I think it's an opportunity. And I didn't have peace. I, you know, you ever had that feeling like, ah, you got angst? Like, I don't know. So it's about 24 hours since the guy had emailed me and we corresponded. I knew I had to get back to him and I was talking with someone in my office and I had this new idea, right? A new option. And the idea was simply this. Talk to him over the phone. So I emailed him and said, hey, when you get a chance, I got some questions. Call me. A few minutes later, he calls me up. I said, look, I got to be honest with you. I said, question one and two, I think I can handle. Question three, I think it's dangerous. I really don't think it's a good way to go. He said, Pierre, he goes, I was just throwing out some options. We could talk about whatever you want. We could talk about your recent trip to Cuba. We could talk about whatever. I was like, I got peace. I'm in. <laughs> so for an hour long on Tuesday, live radio station, I was able to share my faith, share my journey I, to a secular audience, talk about Jesus, <laughs> spread God's word, talk about a mission trip I was on. There was a different option. I had the peace and I moved forward and God blessed it. But at times, God's holding you back because there's something that you got to figure out. And the Bible says that as much as it's up to you, in other words, as much as it's your responsibility, 
live at peace with all men. In other words, take the effort to break down walls. Instead of building walls, build bridges and try to find ways to make peace with people. And ask yourself this question. Will my decision promote peace in my most valued relationships? Now, in order to answer that, you have to know who are my most valued relationships. If you're married, I would suggest your husband or wife, that's a key relationship. And you need to seek peace in that relationship. But if you don't know who that is, you got to start there. Is this decision going to promote peace in the relationships that I have? God's wisdom is peaceable. God's wisdom is also gentle. The word gentle means considerate, meek, forbearing, reasonable, and one of the best ways to understand this word is to look at some antonyms like rude, inconsiderate, selfish, harsh, intolerant, and unfair. I found this on the internet this week. I thought it was cute. There were these packages of candy left on every seat of an airplane. And inside you see that there's a note. Let's bring it up and show them what the note read. Here's what the note read. Hello, we're twin baby boys on our first flight and we're only 14 weeks old. We'll try to be on our best behavior, but we'd like to apologize in advance just in case we lose our cool, get scared, or our ears hurt. Our mom and dad, a.k.a. our portable milk machine and diaper changer, you ever been one of those? Have earplugs available if you need them. We're all sitting in 20E and 20F if you want to come by to get a pair. That's pretty considerate. That's good, right? How about this one? This note was left at a register as someone went to pay for their meal. It said this, I wanted to offer to hold your sweet baby while you both ate lunch, but my husband said I'd look like a stalker. So I'm buying your lunch instead. Enjoy that sweet baby. We have teenagers and know what's ahead of you, so snuggle your wee one while you can. That's wisdom. God's wisdom is considerate. In other words, it's fair to other people around you. The question you need to ask yourself, is this decision considerate? Is it fair to others? God's wisdom is next submissive. We love that word, don't we? That's a tough one. Your translation in your Bible might read, willing to yield. It means you're not stubborn nor obstinate. You're of a yielding disposition. It means you don't have to always have it your way. And no better model of a wisdom that is willing to yield than Jesus. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, looking upon his own death, did not want to go to the cross. Oh, did he want to save you? Yes. Did he love you? Yes. But he was asking God, Lord, it looks pretty black and white. You got another option for me. Is there another way, Lord? But he said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup. Yet not what I will, what your will be done. Are you considerate when you make decisions? God, I want your will. James hammers on this one too. He says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go do this, we'll do that, we'll spend a year here or there, we'll carry on with business, we'll make money. Why, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. What's your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, James says, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. I am very guilty many times of saying the things I'm going to do. Oh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And sometimes it works out, but sometimes it was me and not he. Been there? And so I always need to be in a place where I say, God, I'm asking for wisdom. I'm seeking the best, but I am surrendered to your will because I want your will and not just mine. Because sometimes you bear a cross and it ends up bearing fruit for multiple people. Sometimes you make a decision that's difficult and it's painful now, but it brings joy later. The Bible says it was for the joy set before him that Jesus bore the cross. In other words, Jesus looked at the cross. He said, this is going to be very painful, but I see the joy of people in Washington Crossing sitting who have the assurance of their salvation. I'm going to do it. 
And at times, you have to bite the bullet and you have to sacrifice for somebody else and it feels raw. And I wish I could tell you that it felt good. It doesn't. And you have to consider it joy because it doesn't feel like joy and you have to say, I'm doing it because it's, I'm taking one for the team. God's wisdom submissive. So we ask ourselves, am I surrendered to and honoring those in authority in my life? So God being the primary authority, but how about the people who are also in authority in your life, whether it be your parents, if you're a child here, or whether it be a supervisor, are you willing to be a, a, a submissive person? That doesn't mean you don't try to lead up. That doesn't mean you don't try to push forward, present your ideas. It means that ultimately you realize we're all people who are in submission to somebody. Now God's wisdom is full of two things. It's full of mercy and that's the first one here. Mercy means ready to pass by a transgression and to grant forgiveness to those who offend. We were singing a great song this morning, weren't we? Mercy triumphs over judgment. And that's from James. It says, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Are you forgiving? Are you able to let things go? Do you treat people not as they deserve, but as God treated you in Christ? Do your decisions show the mercy of God or the judgment of God? When you see people's wrong choices, not their right choices, do you instantly go to judge them or do you say, you know what? I've made a lot of mistakes too. Maybe not that mistake, but I made my fair share. Are you forgiving? God's wisdom is merciful. John Hopkins Medicine did a study, and the studies have found that the act of forgiveness can reap huge rewards for your health, lowering the risk of heart attack, improving cholesterol levels and sleep, reducing pain, blood pressure, and levels of anxiety, depression, and stress. And research points to an increase in the forgiveness health connection as you age, which means as you get older, when you forgive, there's greater health benefits. You want to do something for your body? Forgive. People who hang on to grudges, however, are more likely to experience severe depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as other health conditions. According to a survey by a nonprofit, Fetzer Institute, 62% of American adults say they need more forgiveness in their personal lives. See, God's wisdom isn't just because God's trying to say, don't do this, do that, and we don't like that. God has your best interest in mind. Amen. When God says forgive, does he want it so that you have a better relationship? Yes. Does he want it because he wants you to show other people what Jesus looks like with clothes on? Yes. But he also knows it's going to benefit you. When you forgive, God's wired your body in such a way that it's actually healthy. It's good to forgive. It's God's wisdom. God's wisdom is full of mercy and it's full of good fruit. That word good fruit means that it's not just your words, but it's also your deeds. Oftentimes we think of wise people as like the sage who sits and, or maybe it's just a person who has a certain persona, you know, looks a certain way. Like, you know, when people wear a beard, they kind of look a little bit smarter, right? That's why I'm sporting this today. What do you think? <laughs> Did it help? Come on. No, all right. Just didn't help much. I could tell. But listen, we sometimes think that the wise person is the one who's got all the witty things to say. Oh, he's wise. Listen to what he said. James saying, look, it's not just the words. You, you know someone who's wise by the life that they live. So don't go get advice from a person whose life's in shambles because of their decisions, not because of circumstances. The wise people are the ones who live it, not just the ones who talk it. James says the wisdom that is from above is fruitful. Here's what he says. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility. That comes from wisdom. James is like, bam, bam. He's hammering us, isn't he? I mean, I don't know about you, but James is one of those guys that I think if he were here in our day, he'd be a great social activist. 
he would be moving out to help people. He'd be, he'd be motivating the church. Let's go help people. Come on, get out of your comfort zone. Let's go help people. And he'd be the type of friend that you would have a love-hate relationship with. He'd be the type of person to just tell you like it is, even if it hurts, because he loved you. That's the type of guy this James guy is. And sometimes we need people in our lives who will tell us like it is in love, even when it hurts. Do you have people like that? My wife is one of those wise people. My wife speaks such wisdom. And when she gives me a word, I know it's right. I don't always want to hear it. I don't always want to heed the counsel. But there's something in me that goes, that's right. And James, one of those guys, he's just going to, boom, I'm going to tell you how it is. He's saying, look, wisdom is shown. Wait, Jesus, but wisdom is proved right by her children. You're probably thinking, wisdom as children? I didn't even know wisdom was expecting. What does that mean? It means this. The fruit of our lives, our children, is the evidence of the wisdom that we have. You know a person's wise by their children. Not just their biological children, by the product of their life. That's how you know. So do my actions, words, and attitude bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit? That's how you know you have God's wisdom. See, it's not about rhetoric. It's not just about saying the right things. It's about living a life of wisdom. God's wisdom is void of two things. It's void of partiality. So God's wisdom is impartial. And impartial means to never be swayed by self-interest, worldly honor, or the fear of man. And we are living in a time in which people are crying out, we need impartial judges. We need impartial police officers. We need impartial people. We need people who will look at a situation and say, I'm going to judge it for what it is, not just because of how it'll benefit my political party, not just because of how it'll benefit my people. I'm going to do it because it's right. I'm going to call things as they are. I'm not going to do it just because it's going to favor the people that I like. God's wisdom is impartial. And if there's anyone ever who's been for impartiality, it's God. God looks upon all human beings. He loves us all. And he says, look, when you judge on things, be impartial. Step away from it and ask what's really right. James Continuing, says, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy clo old clothes also comes in. He's talking about a church meeting, right? You got someone who comes in, they're dressed in the nine, they're all decked out, and you got someone who, what is that? <laughs> they kind of stink. If you follow me around after church and just during the week when I'm off work, I like to wear kind of homeboy clothes. You know what I'm saying? Like the hoodie, sometimes, shorts. I mean, I don't dress like this. This is about as dress up on a weekend, right? I like to wear stuff that makes me comfortable. And I found that when I walk into a store, if I'm dressed up or if I'm dressed like homeboy Pastor Pierre, I get two different looks. And sometimes people will look at me like, dude, what are you wearing? And they'll treat me that way. And other times, they'll be like, can I help you, sir? You get called sir when you dress up in a suit. You know, you have a tie on or something, right? But God's wisdom is impartial. God says, look, I'm not looking at the color of your skin. I'm looking at the condition of your heart. And let's be honest. That's tough. Because we all tend to look at how someone looks on the outside. They got tattoos. Oh, too many tattoos. Oh, one tattoo, two tattoos. Okay. Wow, they got so many tattoos. I don't know. They're one of those tattoo people. <laughs> oh, an earring's okay. We're, we're okay with guys having earrings now, but they got one of those plug things. Do you know it's irreversible? Once you get it like that, it's never going to change. Come on. Let's be honest. Where's that impartiality in your decisions? He goes on. You see two people coming in. He says, here's a good seat for you, favoritism. But he says to the poor man, you sit there. Sit over by the floor, by my feet. 
Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Ask yourself this question. Is my decision unbiased based on what is in the best interest of everyone involved, not just my own? Let's just admit that that's tough. And let's ask God for the wisdom and the courage to have that type of decision making. Last one here. God's wisdom is without hypocrisy. This means to be without pretending to be what it is not. You know, there's a lot of freedom in learning to be just who you God made you to be and stop trying to be like somebody else. It says it's acting always in its own character, never working under a mask. God's wisdom is not hypocritical. James tells us, what good is it my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works. In other words, it's hypocritical to talk and not walk. He says, can that faith save him? Not meaning is faith enough to save. He's saying, is that saving faith? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled. In other words, be blessed, bro. God bless you. Have a good side. Have a good week. Be blessed. Extend that hand. Like pushing them away. Be blessed. Without giving them the things that they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. James says, look, if you're going to talk the talk, would you walk the walk? Would you make sure you practice what you preach? This week, I was like, boy, to deliver a message like this, I have to make sure that I personally practice what I preach. So you know what I did? I got into a room, and I got my notes, and I practiced what I was going to preach two or three times. The drummer's coming up to give me that. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to tip your waiter. Thank you. Here's the question you need to ask yourself. Is the choice I'm making free from hypocrisy? If it were on YouTube, would you be happy about it? If someone called your mama to tell you what you were doing, tell her what you were doing, would you be okay with that? You ever see the movie The Truman Show? Oh, I love that movie. Jim Carrey's in this movie in which everybody sees his life and he doesn't know. He's on a TV show. And they're all watching everything he does. Everything he does in front of the mirror in the bathroom while he's by himself. All the foolish things that he's doing. And he has no idea everything's being recorded. Live your life as if the red button has been pushed. God's wisdom is without hypocrisy. So let me ask you these questions. If this day you said, I am determined this day to walk in wisdom and ask God for wisdom, do you think you would make better choices? How about this week if you said, I'm committed this week to pray for wisdom and to do my best to walk in a spirit of wisdom? Do you think you'd have a good week or at least make better decisions than if you didn't? What would happen if you take that and said five years from now, if I continue to walk in wisdom, what would be the outcome? 10 years, 15, 20. And consider how your life would be different if you decided to walk with wisdom and continually pray for wisdom. How would we as a church body be different if we said we're going to be wise in the way we treat one another, in the way we love on one another, in the way we're merciful to one another, in the way we're gracious to one another. You see, this is the gospel. The gospel says that it's God's wisdom, not our wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1, 23, 24 says, We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, what is he? He's the power of God and the wisdom of God. Let me explain. 
The gospel is this message that it's God's wisdom to treat us better than we deserve. You see, human wisdom says, I'm going to make decisions that are all in my self-interest because it'll benefit me. But God's wisdom is this. I'm going to send my beloved son to the earth to live a pure life, to be gentle, meek, peace-loving, to be willing to yield to my will, to surrender without partiality so that you and I could have salvation. I'm going to send my son to die for you, to live a life for you so that you can have eternity with me and have a relationship with me. That's the wisdom of God. That's the wisdom that God wants us to operate in. It's not a worldly wisdom. It's God's wisdom. It's from above. It thinks differently than we think because his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher. His ways are greater. He says, look, I don't look at life like you do. I look at the benefit of other people, not just the benefit of myself. I'd be willing to let my son die for you, even though that hurts both of us, because I want to see you live. And the gospel message is just that. God died so you could live. And that's his offer. He says, I sent my son to die so that your sins could be forgiven and you could live. And he gives you that choice to accept that gift of salvation and you could say yes or you could say no. And he never twists your arm. And that's what I want to present to you today. The wisdom of God which is found in Christ that God loved you so much he would allow Jesus to die for every wicked thought, deed, motive that you've had. And you can do that by just saying, Jesus, I need you. I believe you died for me. I need your forgiveness. Come into my life. It does not have to be complicated. You just pray a prayer from the heart, welcoming Jesus into your life. Welcoming him to wash you clean, to make you new, and committing to follow him. Just say, Jesus, I need you. You could pray that even where you're at. Jesus, I need you. I need you in my life. I've messed up. I need mercy. I don't want judgment. And if that's your desire today, on your communication card, check off starting relationship with Jesus and I'll be able to follow up with you this week. And I'll talk to you about how you can grow and mature in your Christian faith. We're going to welcome the ushers to come forward to receive tithes and offerings today. As you prepare your tithes and offerings, I'm going to give you one last verse that you can meditate on this week. I believe that this verse pretty much sums up how we are to live in such a time as this. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17 says this. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Meaning this, it's time to share the gospel because the gospel is the hope of the world. The president, the next president is not the hope of the world. Sorry to break it to you. Okay? That's not big news, but it is, it, it's the good news that's going to be the hope of the world. It's, 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 it's this. God taking a foolish person and putting them up in front of people who are as intelligent and awesome and wonderful as you are and allowing a fool to become wise. That's, that's, that's what's going to change our world. It's drug addicts becoming ad adorers of God and, and passionate lovers of God. It's liars becoming honest by the power of God. It's jealous women becoming women who are generous. It's stingy people becoming generous. It's people's lives transformed by the power of God, not by the power of man. So make the most of every opportunity. Be bold. People are looking for hope. You got it. It's in you. Be bold. People are desperate. They're looking for hope. Give them hope. Pray for somebody this week. Tell somebody God loves them. Don't have to be complicated. Make the most of every opportunity you have. Be bold. It's not a time for the church to shrink back. We need to be bolder, not weaker. We need to be more confident in our God and what he's done for us. Because, why? The Bible says because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish. 
If you're doing stuff that you know right now in your life is foolish, kick it to the curb. Just come on. Stop it. If you need someone to pray for it to be broken off, we'll pray. It says, but instead, understand what the Lord's will is. Ask God, give me wisdom. As we close today in prayer, I'm going to have Joan, who's going to be over onto this side. And if you have a burden for our nation and you want to pray for this country, Joan is going to be over here praying for our nation. You can join her. If you have a personal need for wisdom in your situation, We'll have prayer team up here who will pray for you. Now, keep your request short. It's not a counseling session. You're going to tell them every detail. Keep it short. They're going to pray for God's wisdom. You might get an idea now. It might come later, but we're going to pray for wisdom. And I feel that there's an anointing today to pray for hope. And if you're in a place of hopelessness and you feel like you need hope, come forward and receive prayer because God is the God of hope. And he wants to break off hopelessness in your life and break off this depression and despair because he's the God of hope. Come forward if you have any prayer requests. Let's rise and praise our God.